to start things off on this panel with MC Armstrong, uh, whose talk is titled, Back in the USSR, Returning to History in Don DeLillo's Zero K. Please welcome MC Armstrong. Okay, I'm uh, losing my voice a little bit. Uh, and I told Brett uh, this morning that that was happening, and he said to me, oh, you should totally play that up. That would be so DeLillo. Honey. You know, I kind of thought to myself, I could. I could sort of play that up a little bit. What would that, what would that sound like to, uh, to play up losing your voice? And I started doing a, an impression for him. I was like, well, we could do Tom Waits. You know, what, what's he building in there? You know, and I think Tom Waits would be a good DeLillo impression because uh, my impression of Tom Waits is an impression of Heath Ledger's impression of Tom Waits in The Joker. I think that's sort of the quintessential DeLillo impression, right? It's the impression of the impression of the impression. Or, or we could do uh, Dana Carvey's impersonation of George H.W. Bush. But uh, it occurred to me it wouldn't be prudent at this juncture <laughs> to do voices because I kept hearing the voice of Andrea saying, we're addicted to fun. <laughs> And I think she's right. I think we're too addicted to fun. And um, uh, there's also DeLillo's voice saying, get serious or die. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to get serious before I die. And uh, start the paper. Um, this is called Back in the USSR, Returning to History in Don DeLillo. Is you okay? We begin, in effect, the sound of a plane touching down. In the Beatles' Back in the USSR, the listener lives in the sound of travel for a brief moment before the lyrics descend. Then, upon arrival, Lennon and McCartney celebrate the women of the Soviet Union, as well as the names of places. The Ukraine girls really knock me out. They leave the West behind. And Moscow girls make me sing and shout that Georgia's always, always, always on my, my, my mind. The song is, of course, more than a simple parody of the national narratives one encounters in the Beach Boys, Surfing USA and California Girls. And Lennon McCartney do not just extol the virtues of Soviet women. They also praise the landscape and musical traditions of the communist country. Oh, show me around your snow-peaked mountains way down south. Take me to your daddy's farm. Let me hear your balalaikas ringing out come and keep your comrades warm. And in the song's chorus, they invite the listener into a brief liminal relationship with their subject when they cut two syllables from the penultimate line to create a companion to the ultimate, back in the US, back in the US, back in the USSR. Thus embedded in the name of the one is the name of the other. For the Beatles, the bridge, conceptually, is in the chorus. The connection is in the name, in the deconstruction of the name, in the illusion of division. Fifty years after back in the USSR and 25 after the fall of the Soviet Union, Don DeLillo takes us back to the borders of the old USSR in zero K. However, in the years between the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the year of Zero K's publication, 2016, a great deal of history has taken place within the context of an age determined to erase a certain kind of history, a certain idea of history. To return to the language of rock and roll, it was Jesus Jones who said after the fall of the wall, right here, right now, watching the world wake up from history. And it was Francis Fukuyama who, in 1992, wrote The End of History and The Last Man, a popular scholarly treatise on the end of the Cold War and the inevitability of a universal and homogenous world, a globalized neoliberal democracy. Fukuyama was not the only scholar celebrating the end of history, if by history we mean a nationalist and class-based model of ideological evolution. Third wave feminists and cyber utopians alike, such as Naomi Wolf and John Perry Barlow, also predicted a bravish new world of radical individualism where free markets and new cybernetic technologies, network systems, global capitalism, would leave the very notion of the state in smithereens. Yet, here we are, back in the US, back in the US, back in the USSR a moment in history where we find the new American president, 
the arch capitalist of the Reagan 80s, going back and forth in a strange multimedia narrative with Putin, 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 as DeLillo says in Zero K, the former KGB officer and the current president of the Russian Federation, both men simultaneously promoting aggressive nationalist narratives as well as a call for new transnational alliances. Don DeLillo, like the French theorists, Baudrillard, Deleuze, and Guattari, has been preparing us for this moment his entire career. DeLillo's fiction, like their theory, constantly reminds us of history and our desire to forget that willful amnesia, that hunger for an end to history that so distinctly marks the American spirit. In his 1988 classic, America, Baudrillard describes a country enraptured with two particular technologies, film and the automobile, driving as a form of spectacular amnesia. Everything is to be discovered, everything to be obliterated. But if the cinematic image and the speed of the car deterritorialize the American mind, to use Deleuze and Guattari's term, DeLillo shows us the exponential consequences of this techno-fantasy of spectacular amnesia. In Zero K, advances in computing have created a moment in history where certain wealthy characters can choose to converge with technology, to embed a simulacrum of their consciousness within a complex computer network and thereby leave history and all its linear, linear players behind in the dust. This neoliberal vision of cheating death through convergence possesses an echo of humanity's timeless desire for timelessness, immortality, the conquest of death as the final frontier. This frontier is Don DeLillo's territory. In Zero K, I read a deepening of patterns that run throughout DeLillo's work, particularly a concern with place rooted in his approach to history, his novels consistently positioning his readers between New York City and the deserts of the American West. In Americana, Underworld, Falling Man, and Point Omega, DeLillo's characters find themselves torn between the spareness and the timelessness of a desert landscape and the immediate mediatization of the city, the skyscrapers of New York cast in unsettling relief by not just the sand and stone of the desert, but also by the ruins, relics, and parodies of civilization one encounters near the wastes and canyons of the former American frontier the burned out hulks of Cold War bombers in Underworld as post-war art after the fall of the wall, the casino of Falling Man as the place American money and former World Trade Center employees travel to after the famous attacks and the post 9-11 sentimental urge to unify settles back into a context of business as usual, division. In Zero K, this division this disconnect is cast in a global transnational light as DeLillo's archetypal U.S. desert moves to the edge of the USSR, a place where his characters and readers, like the first European Americans, are invited to abandon history, the homeland, once and for all. This paper argues that it is through this deterritorialization of the American West and its dream of amnesia and frontier, that DeLillo delivers a devastatingly incisive critique of simplistic nationalist narratives and the equally alluring myths of globalization and cyber utopias espoused by conservatives and neoliberals from both coasts, the bankers of New York City and the techno-visionaries of Silicon Valley. Zero K begins in effect. The novel gives its audience a moment to orient a brief initial scene seemingly grounded in a familiar place, an office in New York City, a conversation between a father and a son. But no sooner do we think we have achieved a bearing, a coordinate on the map, than we realize we are merely remembering New York City and are now in the time of the narrative traveling in a strange land in an armored hatchback with smoked side windows, blind both ways. The driver, partitioned, wore a soccer jersey and sweatpants with a bulge at the hip indicating a sidearm. Thus, immediately, we are mediated, divided from the seemingly immediate scene, the first words. We begin in a memory, a history, triggered in a moment of alienation, partition, division. Zero K takes the reader swiftly into this liminal zone, this place in the desert on the edge of Uzbekistan where a New York City banker named Ross Lockhart has grown a beard 
and is about to hand his aging body over to a faith-based technology called the Convergence. His son has arrived to say goodbye. DeLillo's careful attention to name and place has always provided a counter-narrative to an increasingly deterritorialized zeitgeist, the ungrounded ahistorical myth of the Internet age and Make America Great Again and other nationalist projects that simplify or simply erase the complexities of history. The great cyber utopian dream of our time, the merging of man with machine, what Silicon Valley pioneer Ray Kurzweil calls the singularity, is in DeLillo's hands named the convergence. And Kurzweil's cyber utopia is, of course, not positioned in Silicon Valley, where the real estate is perhaps too expensive to bank the bodies of so many bankers and their second wives, but instead on the edge of the former Soviet Union, where capital can capitalize on the ruins of its former enemies, and vice versa. What DeLillo has set up in Zero K is not a simple linear relationship of cause and effect or singular exploitation and innovation, a singularity, but a project that requires co-illusion, collusion, and cooperation. DeLillo's narrative of our current historical moment, therefore, builds its map upon a territory of names taken not from the technologist or the entrepreneur, but from the careful critical eye of the artist. This is not about singularity. This is about convergence. In addition to Jeffrey's father, his stepmother, Artis, also wishes to converge. This character, like every subject and object in the novel, presents an onomastic dilemma for both narrator and reader, a question of how to properly name. Artis is the first character to give her body to the convergence, the faith-based technology, and as Jeffrey confronts her death and the possibility of her transformation slash transubstantiation, he does so through a struggle with names, onomastics. I used to think of her as the second wife, and then as the stepmother, and then again as the archaeologist. This last product label was not so reductive, mainly because I was finally getting to know her. Throughout the body of DeLillo's work, we encounter this figure, the female archaeologist, the second wife, a woman whose relationship to history is bodily, explicitly and multimodally physical, and whose status as second wife complicates the reader's relationship to the idea of marriage as sacred, if by sacred one means singular. Furthermore, we are also in familiar DeLillo territory with a child struggling to name a momentous figure. Like the children in Falling Man innocently dubbing Bin Laden as Bill Laden. The children of Zero K are also the ones struggling to historicize, to name and place the figures of their moment. But in Zero K, DeLillo raises the stakes by raising the ages of the children. As he almost always does, DeLillo ups the ante. Jeffrey is the son of Ross, the witness to the convergence of artists and technology. He is a recognizable 21st century man-child, a good-natured American in his 30s who still has not found a job, a place in the world. If by deterritorialization we mean the Deleuzian sense of feeling increasingly detached or distant or a disjunction from one's local coordinate in the hypermediated world, then Jeffrey fits that strange mold. He struggles to connect with job offers in the financial sector, the places offered to him by an increasingly placeless place, the Foucauldian heterotopia that is a utopia of diversity to some and a dystopia of relativism to others, New York City, a 21st century networked world so suddenly connected and dynamic that the old names just do not seem to fit or fix anymore. Jeffrey is still young, Still a bit of a modernist insofar as he struggles to find the right job and the right name for the people and things in his life. But Jeffrey is not the only child in Zero K. DeLillo's approach to history, to those who still have the hunger to seek out the truth, if by truth we mean the right names for people, places, and things, can be deciphered in the tension between the two children in this novel, the two sons, Jeffrey and Stack. When Jeffrey returns from the edge of the old USSR to New York City, he finds himself traveling in a taxi with his girlfriend, Emma, and her son, Stack. Jeffrey and Emma are decisively American in the Baudrillardian sense of the American character being stamped with a willful amnesia. 
a resistance to history. Driving through the city, observing Stack eagerly speaking Pashto, Afghani, she said, to enlighten me further. To a taxi driver who was once allegedly a member of the Taliban, Jeffrey describes himself and Emma as two individuals exploring a like-mindedness, determined to keep clear of the past, defy any impulse to recite our histories. Stack's curiosity about Pashto, Afghani, and the history of his father's homeland, the Ukraine, is represented as symptomatic of a general interest in names and places, coordinates. As Emma explains to Jeffrey, Stack talks about the weather all the time, not just today's weather, but the general phenomenon narrowed down to certain places. Why is Phoenix always hotter than Tucson, even though Tucson is farther south? Stack studies the weather both home and abroad, Tucson and Baghdad. But when Jeffrey wonders if he's interested in climate, Emma resists the essentialization, a classic DeLillo move of mystification. Even as Jeffrey seeks to pin Stack and his interest in coordinates down, the boy's mother refuses to territorialize her son so simply. This is about more than climate. He's interested in numbers. High, medium, low. Place names and numbers. Shanghai, he will say. 0 0.01 inches precipitation. And we hear the echoes of Heinrich here. Stack mystifies his American mother. I don't know who he is, and I don't know who his friends are. I don't know who his parents were. What we, the readers, know through Jeffrey is that Stack is curious about all of the ingredients of history. Names, places, numbers, maps. Constructed as a foil to Jeffrey, who has visited the strange dynamic territory of the former Soviet Union, is this teenager who in his bedroom possesses a cot with an army blanket, an enormous wall map of the Soviet Union. I was drawn to the map, Jeffrey tells us, searching the expanse for place names I knew and those many I'd never encountered. This was the boy's memory wall, Emma said, a great arc of historic conflict that stretched from Romania to Alaska. Here in the child's room, like in so many DeLillo novels, is the contrast to the nation of adults so anxiously eager to avoid the topic, if not the entire discipline, of history. Like the children of Falling Man with their secret Americanized name for bin Laden, Stack resists his parents' resistance to history, the elephant in the room. Unlike those prepubescent children from Falling Man, however, Stack lives in the liminal land of the young adult demographic a market designation that quite often territorializes the teenager as an ahistorical heroine in a dystopian future. But Stack does not live in the deterritorialized America of the Hunger Games or Divergence. DeLillo does not remove his teenage character from the maps and territories of history. He does not take us or them out. He does not divide us like bookstores do with their young adult marketplace markers. DeLillo instead leaves us in, all of us together, in a moment of history where this young son doesn't usually have much to say to his mother other than Putin, Putin, Putin. This is what he says. Like so many of us, journalists, daytime television personalities, historians, and citizens alike, Stack's mother, seemingly against her will, is being pulled by the next generation back into the past, back into the USSR. Jeffrey attempts to intervene, tries to reorient Stack and the young man's putatively simplistic linear relationship with the world, his desire to go back. Like so many mentor figures throughout the body of DeLillo's work, think the Jesuit monk in Underworld. Jeffrey takes a linguistic approach to simultaneously sophisticating and grounding Stack's mind, challenging him through a game of generating definitions for things towards a basic agency, toward not accepting the definitions, the perceptions of the old world, but shaping the world himself through constructing definitions of his own. Jeffrey does not want the young man to be overwhelmed by the brutality of history and its oppressive nationalist narratives, but the strategy slash game by which he seeks to save the young man from the sickness of nationalist history is itself rooted in ideas that belong to Martin Heidegger a phenomenologist who has been discredited due to his history. 
his firm fellowship with Nazi principles and ideologies, a paradox that leaves Jeffrey exasperated. History is everywhere, in black notebooks, even the most innocent words, tree, horse, rock, gone dark in the process. Stack had his own twisted history to think about, mass starvation of his forebears. Let him imagine an uncorrupted rock. Thus traveling through New York City, dreaming of an uncorrupted rock for a young man's mind, we encounter the archetypal American dilemma that has so obsessed French theorists from Baudrillard to Tocqueville, that quintessential American hunger to not just escape history in Europe for the virgin lands of the frontier, but to do so in a landscape of capital, trees and rocks, largely acquired from the French in the Louisiana Purchase. The hunger for an uncorrupted rock, a frontier, a green breast of wilderness, an undiscovered country, is of course not just the desire for territory in zero K, but the ambition for immortality. A deterritorialized future in which capital's divisive segmenting machine, as Deleuze and Guattari call it, finally converges with the flesh. The destruction of death as the final neoliberal triumph over history, if only such, such technology and its requisite stack of bodies didn't have to be banked in an affordable landscape, a cheap and specific plot of real estate on the edge of the former USSR. Like Jeffrey, who travels to that territory to say goodbye to his father, stack ventures to that same place to say hello. You say goodbye and I say hello, might be the pat reductive way to end this paper, an echo of another Beatles song from that Cold War past that is still present, but perhaps the more sober place to stop is in Jeffrey's final encounter with Stack, or at least the simulation thereof. In Frederick Jameson's An American Utopia, Dual Power and the Universal Army, he writes that it is easier, someone once said, to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And with that, the idea of a revolution overthrowing capitalism seems to have vanished. Perhaps as an ironic or purely sober response to thinkers like Jameson, DeLillo's convergence, the faith-based technology and the bank of wealthy bodies waiting to converge with that technology, imagines the utopia that replaces the utopian ideologies that once imagined the replacement of capitalism. In doing so, he speaks to a persistent current that still runs through both the East and the West, the desire to sacrifice this time and this place for someplace else, the desire to choose death over life, or rather the desire to leave the conversation with history behind in exchange for war on the one hand or the promise of immortality on the other. Stack, like many contemporary young men in America, Europe, and Asia, decides to run away from home and leave behind the comforts and conversations, the cosmopolitan nuances of New York City. DeLillo does not rip Stack from the headlines and drop him into the straw man hands of ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but instead sends him into the more ambiguous territory of the old USSR, where he enlists to fight for the Ukraine against Russia. It is here in these borderlands where Stack dies, and it is in these same borderlands that Jeffrey witnesses Stack's death on a bank of screens while saying goodbye to his father, who is about to converge. Standing with his bald-headed and bare-faced father and a guide, Jeffrey listens as the convergence is framed for its customers. You are completely outside the narrative of what we refer to as history, says the guide. There are no horizons here. We are pledged to an inwardness, a deep probing focus on who and where we are. This celebration of the self-interested spirit suggests that rather than seeing history as a dialectic of classes or collectives or discourses or tribes, it might just as easily be framed as single lives and momentary touch. Jeffrey does not cotton to this zeitgeist. His sense of humor and its concomitant will to conjure names for the people in this place evaporates as he listens to this guide who has transformed immortality into a commodity. Never mind giving her a name, I thought. That was the last time I wanted this visit to be over. So Jeffrey says goodbye to Ross, the determined father in his uterine tube. 
And just before he leaves, the sealed, screen-studded confines of the underground facility on the edge of the old Soviet Union, he encounters an image. But this time, the shot is prolonged. And the shot, as always with DeLillo, suggests both act and representation, the convergence of immediacy and mediation, embodiment, technology and nature, film and gunfire. And in this final shot, Jeffrey recognizes the distinct image of the figure, khaki field jacket, jeans and boots, spiky hair. He is three times life size here above me, shot and bleeding, stain spreading across his chest, young man, eyes shut, surpassingly real. It was Emma's son. It was Stack. Therefore, even though zero K ends in New York, we will end here, underground, in the desert, in effect, back on the border of the old USSR with an image of the boy's death repeating itself, death rendered deathless by the screen, DeLillo's vision of history as a mystic's record of the causes that fall from effects. Thank you, MC Armstrong. Our next speaker is Albert Mobilio. The title of Albert's talk is Disastrously in Death, Don DeLillo's Mortal Combat. Please welcome Albert Mobilio. Thank you, Joseph. And uh, thank you for organizing this quite illuminating conference. To begin, I want to say that these remarks are, are just that, remarks, rather than an attempt to fully explore this theme, to talk about the role of mortality in the works of an author whose novels have focused on the last days in Hitler's bunker, the assassination of Kennedy, a Bhopal-like catastrophe, 9-11, a futuristic hospice, and who has even titled one book, Underworld, uh, is at best gestural. <laughs> At the television network office where rising executive David Bell works, cryptic memos penned by a subversive fellow who calls himself Trotsky periodically circulate. One memo in particular is of note as it offers a quote from St. Augustine. And never can a man be more disastrously in death than when death itself shall be deathless. As has been much noted during this conference, DeLillo attended Catholic high school and a Catholic college, so it's no surprise he would know his Augustine. Clearly important to him, this quote from City of God will turn up 45 years later after his, its appearance in his first novel, In Zero K. In that book, the narrator, Jeffrey Lockhart, overhears this, death shall be deathless quote, and DeLillo appears to acknowledge the, quote, perplexing paradox and Dr. Seuss-like riddling when Lockhart responds with the unspoken question, what? And we readers might join him and also say, what? Perhaps an acquaintance with the context of the good Bishop of Hippo's statement, or even just the sentences that precede this, this particular quote might clarify the matter. Of all the evils, the one that is the worst consists not in the separation of the body and soul, but in the uniting of both in death eternal. And there, in striking contrast to our present conditions, men will not be before or after death, but always in death, and thus never living, never dead, but endlessly dying. Despite my own 12 years of Catholic education, I can't pretend to decode this naughty bit of eschatological brooding. But my rough sense is that Augustine is saying that death as an end to earthly life is nothing compared to the death of eternal damnation. So our first death, the one delivered by a failing heart or a speeding bus, leaves us, uh, leaves us in a state, a particular state of being, that is being in death. And that another death, or we could put it more understandably, a cessation is required for that death to end. That cessation is prelude to eternal life, the body and the soul united. 
This understanding of Christianity's final things is one that requires what we might call an anticlimax, or what I glibly call, as a wiseacre Catholic high school, former wiseacre Catholic high school boy, a trick ending. The formula of passages from not quite death to death to life or endless disastrous death strikes me as a rather literary conceit, one that seems designed to engage an audience. This notion of death as the determinant element in a narrative arc is made explicit in White Noise, a novel that even among DeLillo's death-besotted books stands out, centering as it does around the creation of a drug that purportedly eliminates the fear of death. Jack Gladney, a professor of Hitler studies at a small liberal arts college, is particularly afflicted with an increasingly corrosive obsession with his own mortality. Gladney and Gladney informs us, quote, all plots tend to move deathward. This is the nature of plots. Political plots, terrorist plots, lovers' plots, narrative plots, plots that are part of children's games. We edge nearer death every time we plot. It's like a contract we all sign, the plotters as well as those who are the target of the plot. Gladney's characterization of just about every human activity from blowing up the czar to playing musical chairs as being pointed toward death is hardly a revelation. We all know where we're headed, but prefer not to think about it while we're tossing a salad for dinner guests. But what is interesting about DeLillo's formulation here is that he views these activities as constructed narratives, as readable, and perhaps even subject to some kind of aesthetic consideration. There are elegant lived plots, and there are those less lovely. That each of these disparate narratives shares the same denouement offers both the comfort of narrative product, progress, and the satisfaction of finality, or at least provisional finality by Augustine's lights. No one wants to close the book or leave the theater until they find out what happens. We don't know quite what happens. Many of us are less sure than Augustine, Hence the reluctance to end the tale. But we are part of that tale, or call it, uh, we are part of that tale, and we experience it as a kind of progression, one that's not necessarily moral, emotional, or spiritual, but at the very least biological and geographic. We grow, we move. In some inescapable ways, our lives are plot. This decidedly writerly notion that death serves as a narrative device, in fact, the narrative device, permits us to measure DeLillo's characters and their dilemmas on a yardstick that prizes action, some kind of motion, over stasis. Early in Americana, David describes the paralyzed, limbo-like state of his corporate peers. Quote, the washroom after lunch was always filled with men brushing their teeth and gargling with mouthwash. There were times when I thought all of us at the network existed only on videotape. Our words and actions seemed to have a disturbingly lapsed quality. We had said and done all these things before, and they had all been frozen for time, rolled up in, a little, in little laboratory trays to await broadcast when the proper time slots became available. Is this what DeLillo views as worse than death? To be outside time, frozen, doomed to tape loop repetition, the setting for this scene is the lavatory, the locale where our corporeality is most in evidence, where David's colleagues make small efforts to diminish the encroaching rot. Within the sanitized confines of American corporate life, the shitter, so to speak, is a domain where, in very Norman O. Brown-like terms, life indeed struggles against death. The struggle, polishing their incisors of, men, of the men David observes is unmomentous when compared to their foe. Or if we were workshopping their plots in a creative writing workshop, we could say that their lives lack narrative momentum, conflict, stakes. DeLillo digs into this point, <coughs> quote, these moments in the washroom with a dozen men sawing away at their teeth were perhaps the worst of all possible times we moved through time and space with the stutter and shadowed insanity of a TV commercial. 
The stasis does resemble a TV broadcast, momentary yet endless. These people exist in an unplotted state. David Bell's diagnosis is that the world, uh, pre-internet, even then in the late 60s, was, that was so often experienced on a screen or through David Bell's viewfinder on his camera, is increasingly uh, felt as repetition experienced as playback. It's a world that lacks story because it lacks the experience of and awareness of finality, the deadliness of death. Like the images on the TV screen, these people are deathless. Of course, that unawareness is precisely what Jack Gladney seeks. Dilar, the anxiety-eliminating drug, joins television as another technological means of dulling consciousness, and Jack wants out of that. He wants out of the knowledge Hitler, genocide, human cruelty that he's immersed himself in, as if to take some kind of homeopathic cure. Jack's acute awareness of his mortality overrides his ability to function in or let alone enjoy the moment. He is beset by narrative projection, always wanting to know where the story is going, how it will end. Even at a cocktail party, he's elsewhere, filling in the details of a plot a disaster flick or war novel, judging the narrative heft in, in aesthetic terms, what would be credible, what would impact the audience. Quote, the question of how many people were present in a particular place seemed important to me, perhaps because the recurring news of airline disasters and military engagements always stressed the number of dead and missing. Such exactness is a tickle of electricity to the numbed brain. The association, owing to the enumerative imagery that comes readily to mind here, is Eliot's appropriation of Dante in the wasteland. A crowd flowed over London Bridge, so many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Jack is energized by the spectacle, the drama of mass death. There is nothing more sensational in a tabloid, purely dramatic way uh, than, than this image or the subject of, of mass death. If Eliot had in mind the loss of the First World War, Jack has in mind perhaps the crowds he lectures about, the German crowds uh, in, in, the, in the Hitler, uh, the Nazi documentaries he shows. Quote, many of those crowds, he says, were assembled in the name of death. Processions, songs, speeches, dialogues with the dead, recitation of the names of the dead. To become a crowd is to keep out death. The crowd is a place to hide from the particularness of mortality. I will die. To lose oneself in the mass of fellow bodies is perhaps a lesser acknowledgment. We will die. The story of the mass is a sociological tale and perhaps serves only as background to the much more affecting, more compelling story of the lone protagonist. We will die is a historical or demographic fact. I will die is a catalytic revelation. It is this solitariness, the aloneness of death, that eats at Jack. And that's why his, the love of his wife and children does not avail. He cannot avert his attention from his own plot. The airborne toxic event, one of DeLillo's great locutions as it mimics the hollow elegance of corporate non-speak, even as it partakes of sideshow ballyhoo and the commercial come on, Step inside, ladies and gentlemen, and see for yourself the one and only toxic event. The, the novel's airborne toxic event is a chemical accident very similar to what occurred in Bhopal, India. But White Noise was published only several weeks after that disaster in late 1984. So we might credit DeLillo's prescience, but there was no shortage of dead, deadly environmental emergencies before that. DeLillo's description of the phenomena explicitly takes on the quality of a religious or mythic vision, as if instead of witnessing a mere corporate fuck up, Jack could be viewing the last judgment or the arrival of the seven horsemen. Quote, back on the road, we saw a remarkable startling sight. It was the black billowing cloud lighted by the clear beams of army helicopters. The enormous dark mass moved like some death ship in a Norse legend, escorted across the night by armored creatures with spiral wings. 
Our fear was accompanied by a sense of awe that bordered on the religious. It is surely possible to be awed by the thing that threatens your life, to see it as a cosmic force so much larger than yourself, more powerful, created by elemental and willful rhythms. The toxic cloud is described as if it is a welcoming embrace, a force that is large and powerful. Jack's reaction suggests several possibilities, that the cloud does not kill individually, but kills masses, kills the crowd, so any one death is subsumed in the others, or that the cloud is the cloud of unknowing, a state of surrender to God's will, one detailed in that medieval work of Christian mysticism or that the cloud's terrible beauty is the climax of some epic poem, a quest, or apocalyptic tale, and as such offers the possibility of cessation and ending, a way of stilling the apprehensive, plot-hungry mind about what is to come. The cloud is what has been coming, what has always been coming for Jack. Of all manners of possible demise the author could have chosen, it seems that the descriptive imagery employed here can readily accommodate the notion of a good death, that is to say, a benign event. Taken up within the luminous darkness and embrace of the cloud, Jack would quite literally be in, in death, as Augustine's phrase goes. He would be inside its, quote, elemental and powerful rhythms. But we are also mindful of this cloud's distinctly earthly origins. It is, as Jack notes, quote, death made in a laboratory, defined and measurable. DeLillo's airborne toxic event then combines the apocalyptic imagery of Christian and pagan myth, a warm communal embrace, embrace and escape from death's solitariness, and the carelessness and greed of corporate malefactors. It is a complex mortality system, one worthy of complex storytelling. The arrival of the deadly toxic event isn't the conclusion of white noise. It's something of an anticlimax, a precipitating event for further mortal encounters. Perhaps it is not unlike the first death that St. Augustine writes about, the death that predicates another finality and perhaps salvation. DeLillo's meditations on the end of consciousness suggest we regard that conclusion as not unlike the end of a story. Death, he may be saying, is proof that even God is subject to the demands of good storytelling. Thank you, Albert Mobilio. Our next speaker is Sunil Yapa, and the title of Sunil's talk is Halfway Hopeful, Half Halfway Hopeful, DeLillo and the Revolution. Please welcome Sunil Yapa. Thanks, Joseph. I just want to say, um, holy cow, guys. This has been an amazing panel. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be invited to, to speak with these people. I approach this um, as a writer, as someone who read DeLillo in grad school um, deeply, deeply to learn how to write, and, and then in doing this project, um, fell down the rabbit hole of going back into those books and, and you know, looking for a, a phrase or, oh yeah, when did, when did um, Bill Gray say, you know, terror, you know terrorism is um, the new narrative, and then reading chapters and chapters of Mao Tzu, and so falling down, and then, you know, um, not surprisingly recognizing the rhythm of my own sentences there, because that's where I went to learn how to write, but um, naively, surprisingly to me, recognizing the rhythm of my own thoughts um, and my own themes in DeLillo. And maybe that was why I was attracted, or maybe, maybe he influenced me in some way. So this is just um, a few remarks about that. In a 2005 interview with Stéphane Beau and Jean-Baptiste Doré, Dun DeLillo remarked, Writers must oppose systems. It's important to write against power, corporations, the state, and the whole system of consumption and of debilitating entertainments. You know, in America and in Western Europe, we live in wealthy democracies. We can do virtually anything we want. I'm able to write whatever I want. But I can't be part of this culture of simulation in the sense of the culture's absorbing of everything. In doing that, it neutralizes any dan anything dangerous, anything that might threaten the consumer society. In Cosmopolis, 
this is still DeLille talking, in Cosmopolis, Kinsky says, what a culture does is absorb and neutralize its adversaries. If you're a writer who, one way or the other, comes to be seen as dangerous, you'll wake up one morning and discover your face on a coffee mug or a t-shirt, and you have been neutralized. We find this thread running through all of DeLillo's work, although far be it from him to write what we might typically call a protest novel, or as Baldwin would have it, a novel of, quote, self-righteous, virtuous sentimentality. It's difficult to say with any conviction that DeLillo himself, or the work in particular, believed that there is any radical possibility still existent in what we call protest, or even revolution. It's theater. In the society of spectacle, protest is one more example of the absurd. Consider this rumination from Eric Packer in Cosmopolis. Even with the beatings and gassings, the jolt of explosives, even in the assault on the investment bank, he thought there was something theatrical about the protest, ingratiating even, in the parachutes and skateboards, the styrofoam rat, the tactical coup of reprogramming the stock tickers with poetry and Karl Marx. He thought Kinsky was right when she said this was a market fantasy. There was a shadow of transaction between the demonstrators and the state. The protest was a form of systemic hygiene purging and lubricating. It attested again for the 10,000th time to the, markets, to the market culture's innovative brilliance, its ability to shape itself to its own flexible ends, absorbing everything around it. There is a tension then in DeLillo's work between an opposition to power and systems and the recognition that such a stance is nearly impossible, always co-opted and absorbed by the forces it opposes. This is the brilliance of the capitalist liberal democracy. This is middle class consumption. This is the gorgeous trap of the supermarket. Like electricity and running water, all but invisible until you don't have it. In DeLillo's books, in his prose, in his syntax and diction, in his dialogue, in his plots, there is the unending search for the oppositional space and act, the one not so easily digestible, the one which will not appear on the side of a coffee mug. And yet these books are death haunted, shadowed by a sort of atomic bomb nihilism, what Deleuze in writing about Beckett called, quote, the exhaustion of possibility. The bomb ends it all. The bomb is everything. So to photographs, which by being endlessly reproducible, perfect copies, sever our connection to objective reality if that gossamer slippery thing ever did exist. In this subjective, pornographic world we call the West, the developed world, or for short, just the world, the, the writer no longer carries the charge to change the culture. That power lies famously, according to Bill Gray of Mao Tu, with the terrorist. Quote, the way they live in the shadows, live willingly with death, their discipline and cunning, the coherence of their lives. In societies reduced to blur and glut, terror is the only meaningful act. Is history possible? Is anyone serious? Who do we take seriously? Only the lethal believer, the person who kills and dies for faith. Everything else is absorbed. The artist is absorbed, the madman in the street is absorbed, and processed, incorporated. Give him a dollar, put him in a TV commercial." End quote. You could probably add, put him on a coffee mug. And of course, underlying and running parallel to all of this is the great destroyer of particularity in our time, global capital. And one might add the great destroyer of possibility, alternatives to the supposed and inevitable future. The workings of global capitalism, telecommunications technology, military technology, transportation technology, that is to say, the 24-hour financial global marketplace made possible by the internet, the cruise missile, and the plane, all serve to flatten the world. Eric Packer asserts from his limo that there's only one thing in the world worth pursuing professionally and intellectually, the, inter the interaction between technology and capital, and the inseparability. And yet, sounding out from the epilogue of underworld is this, capital burns off the nuance in a culture. The force of converging markets produce an instantaneous capital that shoots across horizons at the speed of light, making for a certain furtive sameness, a planing away of particulars that affects everything from architecture to leisure time to the way people eat and sleep and dream. 
Not that people all want the same things necessarily, but that they want the same range of choices, end quote. And that same, quote, range of choices seems such a perfectly apt phrase, as if life were narrowing to a smaller and smaller range of the visible spectrum without anyone quite being aware that there once existed more colors than just orange and yellow. The colors of the earth we all inhabit imaginatively, perhaps literally one day, the scorched earth of the third millennium, an era dominated by the promises of global capital and the threat of global terrorism, characterized by the asymmetrical erasure of borders. For people, human beings transported by physical bodies of flesh, borders have of course become walls and roiling dangerous seas. But for money and media, there are no boundaries. Capital and consumption chase each other around the globe like some odd retelling of that old story about the sun and the moon. Meanwhile, we find ourselves in an orange and yellow theme park that looks suspiciously like a juvenile detention center upstate complete with a mini golf course. It is a nightmare Disneyland which is not only largely invisible, but inescapable, inescapable. One in which we talk, eat, watch, shit, think, speak, feel, and experience the same thing, all the while arguing over who gets the orange chair and who gets the yellow. How far we have come from the glorious opening of Underworld. He speaks in your voice, American, and there's a shine in his eye that's halfway hopeful. Is it even halfway hopeful? Where does hope for true opposition lie? Opposition to what? And how? The more you try to escape, the deeper your entanglement becomes. No critique without a subject, to paraphrase Derrida. No protest without a king, to paraphrase Foucault. And as Lee Harvey Oswald discovered in Libra, and of course in his own life, despite all of your, quote, unfettered thoughts, end quote, you still end up a patsy. DeLillo's work contains the recognition of and the reaction against, like, what, like white blood cells to the virus, the cloud of meaningless which bloomed over Hiroshima, spread across the globe, and hovers over us all still to this day, one breath, one tweet, it seems, away from nuclear destruction. The search for stable meaning isn't confined to a reconcil reconciliation with the bomb. We're all going to die! Lenny Bruce told us in Underworld, 90 miles from Cuba, with the missiles ready to fly and resolved the tension for that night at least. But no, we have more to contend with. DeLillo has more to contend with. The American reality that cracked open like an egg falling from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository on November 22, 1963. And a meaningful life in America became possible only if you were willing to close your eyes and ignore the murders of JFK, RFK, Megar Evers, Malcolm X, Dr. Martin Luther King, and the more than three million Vietnamese lives in the, that lost in the American war in Vietnam. But who could or would close their eyes to that? For a time after the civil rights movement, after the protests against American involvement in Vietnam, it seemed we did turn away from mass mobilization, began a journey inward, the reclusive, the reclusive balding artist as revolutionary, he was a man of course, the strumming, singing rock singer as Boda Vista. DeLillo said in an interview with Grail Marcus after a screening of the um, Scorsese documentary, No Direction Home, quote, the genius of rock music is that it matched the cultural hysteria around it. Not only Dylan, but that kind of scorching electric howl of Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison. If to provide an answer, as if to present a counterpart to what was happening around them in the streets, in the riots, in the assassinations, in the war in Vietnam, in the civil rights struggle. Rock was the art form that could match that. Not that these artists all made explicit reference to the immediate culture around them, this is still DeLillo, but the music itself was a perfect counterpart to what was happening in our cult culture. And yet how young that revolution died. How easily, easily that counterculture was subsumed into the larger cult culture it supposedly opposed. The rock and roll revolution sold out almost before the socialist revolution. Who made it first to a coffee mug, Jagger's lips or Che Guevara's beard? In a society, quote, reduced to blur and gl glut, end quote, 
blur and glut. I mean, uh. <laughs> and a society reduced to blur and glut. I think there's uh, it's a TV show on that. There's a difference between, there's no difference between a square and a circle. That hip cat who can't be bought, well, in five years, it turns out, he is as square as a suitcase stuffed with stacks of money, fame, and the non-pleasure of endless, meaningless fucking. Backstage of the show or in the lobby of the hotel where they're holding a swingers convention, who really cares, who really listens, who really knows? As Bucky Wonderlick of Great Jones Street has it, any curly-haired boy can write windswept ballads. You have to crush people's heads. That's the only way, that's the only way to make the fuckers listen. It might seem, in DeLillo's work, to crush people's heads, to blow up the innocent, to set yourself on fire, is what it takes to make the larger society pay attention to any one person and their thoughts, let alone their demands. Following the protests we observed earlier in Cosmopolis, Packer and Kinski watch a man in the street self-immolate himself. Now look, quote, now look, a man in flames. Behind Eric, all the screens were pulsing with it, and all action was at a pause, the protesters and riot police milling about, and only the cameras jostling. What did this change? Everything, he thought. Kinski had been wrong. The market was not total. It could not claim this man or assimilate his act. Not such starkness and horror. This was a thing outside its reach. He could see the coverage in her face. She was downcast. She was dejected now and did not look at him. It's not original, she said finally. And I don't know if the, de the dejection at the unoriginality is Kinsky's, Packer's, DeLillo's, or mine. In a culture of endless assimilation and simulacrum, where do we locate an oppositional space to the total totalizing power of global capital and consumerism? In the rain-slick streets? on the supermarket shelves, the college on the hill? I think not. In a post-capitalist politics uh, written in 20, uh, 20, um, 2006, two geographers, Kathy Gibson and the late Julie Graham wrote, um, I was a geographer my past life anyway. In a post-capitalist politics, two geographers, Kathy Gibson and the late uh, Julie Graham, wrote, what if we were to accept that the goal of thinking is not to extend knowledge by confirming what we already know, that the world is a place of domination and oppression? What if instead we thought about openings and strategic possibilities in the cracks? And it seems simple, but here I find a way forward. I find myself in the desert with Nick Shea, climbing a hill in the early morning sun, I crest, my, crest the hill and find myself, quote, astonished at the number of planes. Sweeps of color, bands and spatters, airy washes, the force of saturated light, the whole thing oddly personal. A sense of one painter's hand moved by impulse and afterthought as much by epic design, end quote. I find myself in this desert thinking as Nick does, quote, Sometimes I see something so moving, I know I'm not supposed to linger. See it and leave. If you stay too long, you wear out the wordless shock. Love it and trust it and leave. So then, is this where we find it? Our antidote to the bomb, to capital, the remote-controlled slavery that we call the global economy, to the commodification of every damn last thing? Do you feel, do you feel it standing with Sister Edgar and Grace, contemplating a billboard, waiting for the image of a lost girl to appear as an angel in the medieval ruins of the Bronx. The image is apt. In DeLillo, we find a sort of spiritual ecstasy of strangeness, an unapologetic, quote, gaudy thing that whistles up out of unsuspected whim. It is there in the room with Lauren lost to time, Mr. Tuttle hiding in the walls, a nameless, disruptive joy that cannot be bought or sold or put on a coffee mug. It is there with Cotter in the opening to Underworld, leaping, leaping the turnstile to the polo grounds in the air and feeling slick and unmust and sort of businesslike, flying in from Kansas City with a briefcase full of bank drafts. I must have quoted that line 
a thousand, two thousand times to Scott Cheshire. I just, I quoted it this morning. I quoted it last night. I, fly, feeling sleek and unmust and sort of businesslike, flying in from Kansas City with a briefcase full of bank drafts. The true disobedient servant to the war profit pleasure machine is strangeness itself. Nick, Albert, and Clara, Bill Gray and Karen and Scott in that house of paper, Lauren, Eric Packer, Cotter tossing a baseball in the street, and Lee peeking into the nightclubs of Tokyo. All of them and more follow idiosyncratic and irrational impulses that take them into other spaces and places and times. From these cracks, the revolutionary may emerge, not the one which fights in the streets, but the one which breaks the frozen sea inside of us. A word on hope. Rebecca Solnit has this to say. It is important to say what hope is not. It is not the belief that everything was, is, or will be fine. The evidence is all around us of tremendous suffering and tremendous destruction. Hope is an embrace of the unknown and the unknowable, an alternative to the certainty of both the pessimist and the optimist. It's the belief that what we do matters, even though how and when it may matter, who and what it may impact, are not things we can know beforehand, or even, in fact, afterward. That hope, then, is the hope in possibility. It is the opening in the crack, and it is there in Don DeLillo's work with these characters and their strangeness. It is there, too, on a deeper level, coded right into the prose, into the syntax and diction. The prose itself an act both of pleasure and protest. It verges at times on the unintelligible, the untranslatable, the private and personal. The language, not the book for sale on the shelf, but the language itself unable to be commodified or easily digested. Language, and particularly DeLillo's language, is the dormant virus inside the host waiting to erupt in a fever dream of language, one which disrupts, one which provides its own peculiar sonic and visual joys. On rereading Underworld in 2010, DeLillo said in an interview with the London Times, in truth, it made me wonder whether I would be capable of that kind of writing now, the range and scope of it. There are certain parts of the book where the exuberance, the extravagance, I don't know, the overindulgence, dot, dot, dot. There are city scenes in New York that seem to transcend reality in a certain way. In the 70s, when I started writing novels, he said, I was a figure in the margins, and that's where I belonged. If I'm headed back that way, that's fine with me, because that's always where I felt I belonged. Things changed for me in the 80s and 90s but I've always preferred to be somewhere in the corner of a room observing. And that, finally, is where we will find the revolutionary hope in the work of DeLillo, in the corner of some room, speaking in his voice, American, and a shine in his eye that's halfway hopeful. <clears throat> well, thank you, Sunil Yapa, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have one speaker left for our conference this weekend, uh, so I'm going to introduce Jacqueline Zubek. Uh, the talk Jacqueline will give us today is called The Word for Currency, DeLillo's Post-Underworld Novels. Please help me welcome Jacqueline Zubek. I looked at all the uh, impressive biographies of everyone here, and I think that you're probably all thinking, what the hell is she doing here? So I want to explain. What the hell are we all doing um, here? <laughs> I, uh, I, I've written about the names, but I'm also uh, uh, the editor of a book of uh, a collection of essays that are it's coming out next year, in the beginning of the year, on uh, DeLillo in the 21st century, all of the works uh, post-2001. And that is going to be called um, Don DeLillo after the millennium, uh, Currents and Currencies. So uh, Joe kindly invited me here on the rumor that that was coming out, but I'm here to confirm it's, it's, it's happening. Uh, Lexington Press. Thank you. Uh, and um, my comments today come out of the introduction to that book and the insights that I gained in uh, reading and working with all those essays, and then you know you write an introduction and go, okay, what 
what brings all this together? What am I going to say that's kind of uh, in something in common or uh, creates that uh, bond between the articles? So um, I will uh, go on. Frequently described as prescient in his anticipation of social trends and political impact, Don DeLillo reads our society and gives voice to the rhythms of our vernacular and jargon. Nourished by decades of work, his 21st century texts, The Body Artist, Cosmopolis, Falling Man, Point Omega, and Zero K, as well as the plays Love Lies Bleeding and The Word for Snow, are honed down, perhaps more domestic in focus, not encyclopedic like their elder brothers. Elegiac, they are punctuated by the silence that renders sound poignant utterly serious, they lay the ground for mordant humor. And in a conference that I ran in 2012 at the College of Mount St. Vincent in the Bronx called Riddled with Epiphanies, we began to answer, ask the question, what is it about the later works? Is there something that we can say marks them um, in particular? So that's where I'm headed in this, in this talk. Um, in 2016, in Paris, in a, a conference entitled Fiction Rescues History, DeLillo himself spoke eloquently about his own close personal experience of 9-11, the eerie moonscape environments surrounding the devastation of the towers, a wasteland that will shadow him, he said, for the rest of his life. Although only Falling Man deals directly with the event that broke the back of the 21st century, DeLillo affirmed that all his later books are haunted by it. Thus, the stories of the last and the lost are intrinsic to this fiction. After all, they accrue in the wake of suicide, the body artist, apocalyptic terror, falling man in Point Omega. They consider the last dying days of an artist in Love Lies Bleeding and a currency trader, of course, in Cosmopolis, and cryogenic preservation, the bodies of the dead, the extremely wealthy dead, uh, are frozen in time and anticipate a technological resurrection, which is the subject of Zero K. Today, however, I want to concentrate on a short reading, a short, uh, on the short play or reading, as, as it is called, The Word for Snow. I think this short dramatic piece can be read as something of a precis of DeLillo's 21st century work. It takes up the themes and concerns of all the 21st century um, and suggests, I think, their collective impact. The Word for Snow appeared in 2014 without any fanfare whatsoever, 1,000 copies. Typed, I think, on DeLillo's own machine, has a little clipped A, maybe someone knows. Uh, and it uh, actually appears in an 8 by 12 typewriter paper format, uh, including uh, photographs of broken down rural backyards and a lot of uh, busted up basketball nets. Its subject is global warming. Thus, only the word for snow remains when actual snow exists no more. Quote, people will live in homes that float, or else they stand in blazing plazas groping for shade, end quote. In this piece, the ineffectual scholar, the clever translator, and the bewildered pil pilgrim symbolize the narrow narrowing potential of the 21st century and the significance of lost possibility that follows in the wake of multinational corporate vampirism and rapacious technological development. Uh, the threat of worldwide inundation represents a unique menace to global society, a hazard which forecasts a kind of constriction or narrowing of venues after the millennium. Elise Martucci, a scholar who considers the concept of space in DeLillo's fiction, writes that characters' ide ideas of identity are reliant on the places where they stand, and they often experience a place-based epiphany that makes them question their perceptions and realities." End quote. Martucci's insights provide one avenue for discussion about the word for snow. The pilgrim waxes poetic in his celebration of place as he stands on a mountaintop. I remember days at the lake, the cry of loons in the stillness. But what happens when the word for loon is all that is left of its mournful cry? What is to be our future when we are threat threatened, literally, with lost ground and foundational resonance 
of earth and earthiness. If human culture is no longer actually in place, what happens to our notions of time? Snow's focus on what the pilgrim refers to as the tiny final moments in a person's life or in the life of the planet suggests the aptness of Jesse Cavaglo's analysis of Point Omega, a work which also has last and lost things on its mind. Cavaglo interprets the term omega point not in Teilhard de Jardin's sense of an undying object of ultimate complexity, but through the sense of an ending and the so somber light in which, quote, we pass completely out of being in the ultimate extraordinary rendition, end quote. The omega point indicates the edge of a lifetime, the end of an embodied consciousness, a consciousness marked and manifested in the consummation of an ending. Point omega makes this loss and conclusion particularly poignant by etching it in the unbearable, palpable absence of a man's child. Earlier, Elster had pontificated on the nature of extinction, a matter of casual reckoning, but extinction comes vividly to life when his daughter Jessica disappears and her palpable absence launches him immediately into a dry and rocky old age. DeLillo's manipulation of time and space gives way to what Cavadlo calls the novel's chief image and plot point, presence and absence itself, end quote. Such a condition comes to bear in the word for snow, where DeLillo anticipates a season of encroaching tides which insists on its own powerful presence and yet erases context and knowable content, present and absence. Oxymoron in the 21st century. Scott Dill, in another discussion of time in Point Omega, argues, we have now entered an Anthropocene period that pronounces human culture's disastrously destructive tendencies as a new geological era when humans have reached the point of influencing geological time, end quote. Indeed, the Anthropocene is characterized by man-made extinctions, not only to flora and fauna, but to the very planet itself, end quote. Not human evolution, but rather planetary devolution, devolution ironically accruing from scientific, economic, and technological progress. Speaking from an unnamed mountain somewhere in the lost corner of West Central Asia, both the scholar and the interpreter affirm time is a lie, perhaps because the, death, the drowning death of the planet cannot accommodate either the human temporal experience or the devaluation of the seasons and the rhythms of the Earth itself. Our present chronotope, that Bakhtin's idea of that time-space confluence, our present chronotope, therefore, is one of waiting, says Scott Dill, in which the end of the present is entirely indecipherable, yet absolutely imminent." End quote. Mark Osteen, writing about Cosmopolis, um, and here I'm thinking about, again about this here and gone again, this presence and absence. Mark Osteen considers the moral impact and global consequence of surpassing greed in the 21st century, and in particular, the ability of traders to utterly dismiss the, quote, binding and ancient obligations of kinship or age-old social hierarchies, end quote. DeLillo plums the psychology and social role of the traders and financiers who have engineered the crisis and Eric Packer, he says, stands for the stable, indifferent, and shifting world that postmodern money has engendered, end quote. Cosmopolis also demonstrates the impact of Packer-type practices in the character of former employee Benno Levin Richard Sheets. Sheets. Levin's squalor and desperation make incarnate the impact of cyber capitalism's violation of responsibility, equity, or loyalty. This degraded moral cl climate, its consequences accelerated exponentially, suggests the sources of global warming. Lack of moral responsibility relates to both the collateral cl crisis, which informs Cosmopolis, and thematically to the intersection of financial and technological devastation. Power brokers have failed to register the impact of their lopsided policies 
and have ignored the planetary bill coming due. Matt Cavanaugh explains that the haircut in Cosmopolis is not, after all, a random plot maneuver, as some critics have declared, but a term utterly appropriate to the theme of the novel. A haircut designates the minimal collateral requirement that institutional leaders require of their borrowers to serve as insurance against the risk of default, a warranty or value that sustains a balance between profit and its cost. Cosmopolis actually reads the signs and anticipates the violation of economic and moral principles and makes evident, quote, the breakdown of cyber capital as a cosmopolitical justification that is a comprehensive theory of existence that reconciles the order of nature, cosmos, with the order of society, polis. The word for snow marks the impact of a similar breakdown in the relationship between nature and society, one that sets us back to a concern for primitive survival, indicated by the scholar who now inhabits a crude mud, mud hut. That's a quote. In his analysis of Cosmopolis, Mark Osteen um, uh, plums the psychology and social role of traders and finance, uh, financiers who engineered the crisis and how the gluttony of a few brought hunger to the many. He considers the collateral crisis in terms of, quote, the abandonment of the gold standard in the 20th century, whereby money was unmoored from its anchorage to float freely on the tides of exchange, end quote. At present, argues Osteen, money is entirely faith-based, but its artificial liquidity is maintained by the high priests of finance who have gone whoring after strange gods. This crooked exchange might also be applied to global warming and that those addicted to luxury speed convenience have failed to register the consequences of their gargantuan energy use, a, condi a condition for which there may be no cure. What is balancing the debt for the resources extracted? What currency can balance the manipulation of markets and money what is the cost of our greed? Tremendous to think about, agrees the pilgrim. Yet he also suggests the depths of denial, but not us, not now, end quote. Rising temperatures due to the degradation of the Earth's interrelated ecological systems relates to Randy Lace's analysis of cyborg existence, the interpenetration of nature and technology. Laced explores this topic and the science which underlies it in his analysis of DeLillo's Love Lies Bleeding, a play about a dying artist, a man experiencing his own last times. Alex is kept alive by various chemical and mechanical devices so that the line between chemistry and cognizance <coughs> is indeterminable, or rather exists as an interdependent network of associations which make it impossible to define the place where physiology ends and consciousness commences, end quote. Laced considers the relationship between electrochemical forces in nature and human identity as, identity as entities which tend to circulate Mobius style one into the other, end quote. Laced sense of a shared surface or intertwined dependency can be effectively related to the Earth and its use of resources as well. Global warming accrues in our failure to curb the riotous spending of our resources and because we have a disdain for collateral, as Kavanaugh says, that might balance the takings. Like contemporary currency trading, conspicuous consumption and the production of an underworld of waste constitutes another form of high-stakes gambling, says Mark Osteen, in which it is possible to lose or win vast sums, end quote. We are losing the game, however, or perhaps, because we have failed to adequately account for the fact that human beings are, are inextricably linked to their habitat in what Laced calls an interdependent network of associations an ecological relationship that relates to both a person's life and the life of the planet. Quote from Snow. What can we conclude about DeLillo's 21st century writing looking through the lens of the word for snow? 
Can we not apply Scott Dill's central point that, quote, endedness reveals not morbidity, but the very experience of meaning, unquote. Grayley Heron, a noted theater scholar, considers Love Lies Bleeding from a, cons a similar consideration of endings. He asks an intriguing question. What might the ethically provocative and personally wrenching end of life decisions look like filtered through the perspective of a dying artist, end quote. What if the various scenes of the play relate to a sketches, series of sketches in the mind of the artist himself facing his own omega point? Does Alex imagine the ways in which his family constructs his identity and plots his euthanasia? Um, of course, you know, as he watching uh, his son uh, talk about, you know, well, well, if we don't, if the street morphine doesn't work, we can always use the uh, turkey basting bag and the duct tape and talk about the humor in the, in the uh, in that play. Are the dialogues in each scene the imaginings of an artist whose perceptions have been carefully honed and made sharp over the course of a lifetime? Similarly, we might ask if the word for snow is DeLillo's ethically provocative and wrenching view of the dying planet, written as a performance piece by the artist who has most eloquently depicted our culture and history and language. The word for snow in its largely unmediated form brings us back to the body in a form created to be a live reading at the juncture in time and space when we face the loss of planetary life as a whole in the very ground of referentiality. Quote, you mean children will build a snowman with a word for snow? Asked the pilgrim. This crucial loss of substantiation is signified at the end when all three characters speak the same unknown language. It's not old church Slavonic, as the interpreter promised, but some other linguistic construction, an untranslatable version of speaking in tongues. Snow then relates to the kind of untranslatable knowledge that terrifies the child Owen Orville Bradamus in the names, a character imagined by child author Tap Axton slash Atticus Lish, who suffers, and you all know the misspellings here, right? A dreadful woe of incomprehension, the nightmare of real things, the fallen wonder of the world, end quote. Indeed, Tack. Tap Axton might have grown up to be the pilgrim, determined to make sense somehow of today's fallen planet. Um, and this idea about speaking in tongues and language, I'm thinking also just uh, about uh, Packer, and I think it's no coincidence that uh, Eric Packer wanders through Cosmopolis thinking about obsolete language, right? The anachronistic quality of skyscraper and office and airport, the novel written in the aftermath of jets flying into office skyscrapers from local airports, constructs an impossible congruence that anticipates the drowning fish in snow or its floating homes. And yet DeLillo consider, continues to pursue his perpetual interest in the physics of language, the fat pocketbook pearly muscle, the dusky seaside sparrow, in snow, this pleasure is particularly poignant because the 21st century has already demonstrated that in many instances, only the word is available for contemplation and oxymoron prevails. Fish are drowning in Great Slave Lake and yet the word fish still clings to the bleached earth." End quote. When things happen that can happen, what are we supposed to believe? The pilgrim asks. Yet despite the conflicts of reference and knowledge, DeLillo clings to the artist's language of particularity and uh, uh, the language to which he has devoted his life. After all, fiction rescues history. Well, thank you for that talk, Jacqueline Zubeck. Looking so forward to this new volume. Uh, 
another thing that we've heard a lot this, this, during this conference is, I apologize for running a little late. Uh, but, uh, so I apologize for running a little late, but I, I want to save some time here before we say goodbye to uh, seeing if there's any questions uh, for our panelists, some final ideas and comments uh, before we bring this to a close. And if there are, please uh, approach the microphone so we can record you for our telecast. <laughs> Scott. I guess this is just more of a, it's a half question for Sunil. Um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but it's something I'm interested in. Um, considering your take on DeLillo's take on protest, and considering DeLillo's take on crowds, what is the difference? Yeah, I was actually, that was one of the, uh, I was telling you at lunch that I went down eight different rabbit holes, and that was one of them, <laughs> was, trying, was working out that determination. Um, obviously, the, him saying the future belongs to crowds. And, um, and then, also, but, but also this tendency, I think, to this move away from really believing that, that the worldwide socialist revolution has any relevance or any meaning in today's world. Um, I, I don't know that that, that's the crowd that he means. Um, I, I don't want to, um, it's uh, frowned upon to say exactly what he thinks, but he, he, in an interview he said specifically about a protest he saw, um, he was at anti, uh, against the Iraq war in, in 2003 in San Francisco. And watching the protest, he said, I just found, I found the form utterly meaningless. You know? Um, so I don't, I don't know how to, Reconcile that really, other than that that specific type of mass mobilization. I don't I don't think there's he finds a meaning for it, or you know, or a way forward out, out of that trap of of the end of history, of of the end of um, the dialectic, right? And so, how do we move forward? Um, I don't I don't think it's through mass mass protests. I have a, I have a question to follow up on that actually which is I'm stunned by how hopeful all of these presentations have been. Uh, that they all end, or, and even begin, and so in, not all, many. Thank you, Andre. yours wasn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they all seem to sort of like, you know, somehow residing within this art, within this imaginative uh, penetration of the world, is some sort of um, salvation from the conditions that we have created and live in. And I don't see that, and I don't see him ever. Uh, you know, the Catholic view is St. Paul's, all creation was made subject to futility um, because we're all going to die. And, and it gets to, uh, you know, the idea of the Augustinian notion that we're living in dying, um, and we're living in death. So, I, I, and I see him as not hopeful in this same way, and I'm wondering why we are, that's all. Hmm. Or are we required to be by social, you know, by the boundaries of social discourse, especially in America? I, I think a really pr simplistic answer to that from, from my po point of view, I mean, I know, yeah, I've, I've got nothing but reductive answers uh, here <laughs> when put in the moment, right? I know this is not going to satisfy half the room. I'll be lucky if it satisfies one person and, that, and the person I'm staying with, right? Um, my answer would be, I mean, look here. We're here. We showed up. Something brought us here. And I think if there's anything instructive about optimism and a faith in something that brought us all here and that we find in Delilah's work, it's language, <laughs> right? I mean, language <laughs> is what presses him on moment by moment, syllable by syllable, rhythm to rhythm. It's not a belief in a revolution. It's not a belief ultimately in history or uh, any political party. It's a belief in what language can do, that kind of intuitive, chirotic, almost m mystical, I, not almost, really, really mystical space, the mysticism you enter into when you enter into a sentence. Those sentences live, you know? 
What's that? Uh, Jack? What's the Beckett line? I, I can't go on. I go on. I can't go on. You must go on. I'll go on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we're, we're all by occupation and disposition inclined to believe in art, in language, as if that's going to change things. I would agree with you. I'm, I'm not particularly hopeful, and I don't know if DeLillo is, but I think, as I say, by profession and inclination, as teachers, we're supposed to believe that. Mm -hmm. And faith doesn't have hope, necessarily. Mm -hmm. It believes in the existence of that which cannot be seen or known. That's not really hope at all. Right. Yeah. Not hope at all. yeah. Jackie, please. Um, in Paris, DeLillo took a lot of questions, and uh, he described, uh, this was way back to white noise, and he talks about, and I'm not sure the context, but the radiance of dailiness. And it's always been a line, I just love it. And I, so I asked him about it. I said, mm. could you just talk about that a little bit? And he said, no, it's not about the characters. It's how I look at the world. That's my perspective, the radiance of dailiness. And you know, we see that in you know, the body artist when she's looking out, you know, the, just the bird outside mm -hmm. the window is just this, this beautiful thing, and Sunil, you you mentioned those 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 small pieces that um, show us beauty in the world, and and perhaps you know um, rescue us from crowds and from violence and it's all that. Bronzini's walks and under yeah yeah yeah. yeah. It, it's mind. Variations. You know, particularly as a monk, and not even a monastery monk, but more like the desert fathers, you know. Stayed individually in a cave and, you know, tried to appreciate the one nut that they would eat every day. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it also may maybe um, a longing for the unmediated moment, if that's even possible, right? To, to be in the now, in the present with the bird in these small moments? Yeah. But, but Vince, you were asking, those are all very personal, perhaps even solipsistic solutions. You were asking about hope or, or <laughs> optimism about, about the socio political planetary life. And oh, I, we're I don't. Fucked. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. But I think all of those, I mean, one hates to be reductionist, but stop and smell the flowers, right? I mean, I suppose that works, and that's the one not in a monastery that you're, you're attending to. I, I don't know. I tend not to think. And I don't, that, that use of that Beckett quote, I can't tell you how many students I've had who have had that illiterate students of mine who have that tattooed on their arm <laughs> as if it's some kind of hopeful thing. I, I don't read it that way at all. Can I use the microphone? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's not really a question. So I felt weird using the mic. Please. I feel like if I'm going to make a statement, I can do it from the gallery. Um, <laughs> uh, just thinking about this question that you're asking and this idea about hope or optimism um, and the task maybe of the writer. We've been talking a lot about DeLillo as like uh, the sort of prophetic prophecy sort of thing that's in his books. And uh, it seems to me, I've been thinking a lot this year. Uh, about climate change, which is something I'm, you know, working on, and, and other people. I really appreciate your talk, Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, and uh, and one of the books I've been using to think through it is a book by uh, Indian novelist Amitav Ghosh, wrote this book, The Great Derangement, which is really fantastic about literature and uh, climate change. And and he has this this line toward the end where he's talking about uh, the role of art, which I think is what we're talking about. And he talks about it not being the role of politicians and bureaucrats to like imagine the possibilities of the world, right? Like, that, that's not their role. But that's a role that artists can fulfill, is to imagine possibility. And it doesn't have to be positive. It doesn't have to be negative, right? Um, but it could be either or both. And it seems to me that one of the things we're praising over and over in DeLillo this weekend is his 
imagining of possibilities that have come to pass. The world could be like this, and then it was, right? And they're mostly dark prophecies, but they're still there. But I also think there, there's a lot of room in that idea of the task. And also, if you talk about language and his, the, uh, the possibilities of language, what language can do is something that DeLillo is constantly changing my personal perception of. Um, and new language produces new thoughts, which produce new possibilities. And so even if it's not really hopeful or optimistic, it seems like creating possibility as an artist um, is, a, is a powerful act and something that seems all over Delo's work, even if the worldview of the book is, is negative. And I hope that's not too hopeful for you, Vince. <laughs> but I think it's something that I, I sort of deeply believe in. I endure it. <laughs> have, have we got time? Oh, we do. John, please use the microphone. Uh, I would take it in another direction completely. Hope <laughs> is the thing with feathers, and I don't see any feathers here. But uh, the, uh, I would say that one of the distinguishing facts of his later work, of the, of the post-2000 work, call it what you will, is uh, a deeper investigation of family breakdown. You know, in, in Underworld, there is this background of the family, there's even the line, he did the worst thing any Italian can do, he left his family. And, uh, you know, I would be interested in how you explore that particular breakdown rather than the global breakdown. I didn't find this panel particularly hopeful, if anybody <laughs> cares. And the idea that going off into the desert and finding ecstasy is hope for the world, mm -mm, I'm with Albert on that. <laughs> Jackie, did you want to talk about that one? Um, the family, that family, mm -hmm. breakdown. Uh, I, I had something brilliant to say, but it just <laughs> No, I, I, I did think of something. I mean, I think, I think one place where we can find a really kind of dark, inverted optimism is back in Randy's talk. You know, mm -hmm. when we look at what Trump has accomplished, what we see is that postmodernism works. Right? We see that language and iconoclasm works. Uh, it's been repurposed. Uh, it's been, uh, and by not just Trump, but by people like Steve Bannon who I think may have, I think Bannon might have been a friend of DeLillo's in another life in the 1970s, you know, in some parallel universe. I mean, this kind of thinking, this kind of approach um, does not ring with our values, but on the other hand, it does ring with our tools. Um, when I look at the Trump campaign, what I see is a guy who changed the script. Um, I see a guy who deployed a metaphor. And it's a, it's a metaphor that DeLillo works with all the time. It's a metaphor fueled on sexuality, right? DeLillo's always talking about food and the body and sex. That's what Trump returned us to. He returned us to the body and uh, candidates whose bodies just don't seem up to the task, right? What was Jeb Bush? He was a low energy candidate. <laughs> He was low stamina, right? There was a sort of metaphor of embodiment in the Trump campaign that we see in DeLillo's work. And I think it's one of the things that has brought this conference together, this, the power of the body in a kind of disembodied, deterritorialized age. I think the other side, the left, would be wise to remember the body. Hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't what I asked, but I well, probably got it. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, though, nonetheless. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Anybody else want to have a final comment? I have to say, in terms of hope, one of the things that I've, I've mentioned to many of you, but, but I, was the sense that, the, that uh, my students uh, and the, the, the creation of this course all happened before <clears throat> the election. And it, there is something uncanny about uh, encountering DeLillo, particularly for many of my students for the first time. Uh, post-election, and that there is a, a, a strange um, comfort that's been found in our class discussions about these books and the world that DeLillo's created. And I've, I've, I've mentioned before that there, before this, uh, I forget which speaker now talked about, oh, uh, it was Randy. Uh, we're back in business now, right? With, <laughs> with, um, but before that, there was, a, there was that comfortable strangeness that we came to associate with DeLillo. And, um, and now, if there's any hope there's a, uh, a recognition that's happening in these books, I think, for some of my, my students who are reading DeLillo for the first time, and for me too, a, a way of feeling like, 
not so much prescience anymore, but he saw, it, it, it's not so much marveling at the prescience, it's this place that he's created that now is familiar mm -hmm. in some ways that we need a guide for. And I think there, if there's hope there, it's, it's found somehow in that. But I wanna thank all of you uh, for, for this weekend. Um, I, I, I think I'm the most pleased than anyone that it happened at all. And um, we, we, were, we came here in 2000, 17 to convene, and we discussed uh, sacramental speech, the word of God, contemporaries, identity, dark times. Uh, we talked about correspondence, prologues, walls, and humor. We talked about the perception of media, Trump, post-truth, New York City, and history, death, revolution, and DeLillo in the millennium. And it's such a pleasure to have been able to share this weekend with you and to explore these ideas about one of our great writers, Don DeLillo. Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe Salvatore. Thank you, Joe.